This is a function in Python. All it does is it prints a greeting for whatever name is passed in as the argument. And if I call it, I get an output like this. Hello, Pixagami. Now watch this. Here's the same function again with a decorator. A decorator is something that can modify the behavior of a function. This particular one will cause the execution of the function to repeat five times when I run it. Now here's the function again with a different decorator. This one obfuscates the input. And here's another one that turns the input green. Finally, here's an example that combines all three on the same function. These examples might already give you an idea of what a decorator is and why they are such a powerful tool in Python. They let you modify the behavior of a function without even having to create a class. And you can even mix and match them to combine their functionality. Welcome to the channel. My name is Jack. And in this video, we're going to dive into how a decorator works in Python by looking at some simple examples. We'll also learn how to write a custom decorator to measure a function's execution time and another one to optimize the function so that it runs faster by a thousand fold. If that sounds good to you and you want to learn about how to use decorators in Python, then let's get started. The decorator design pattern in software engineering is generally when you extend something, like a function or an object, with additional functionality. In Python's case, most decorators are a function that wrap another function, sort of giving you a powered up version of that function in return. By powered up, I mean you can take additional arguments or it can do extra things before and after that original function when you execute it. So how is this useful exactly? Let's look at a real example of a problem. Say I have a function and it's pretty slow and I wanted to measure how long this function takes to execute in Python. Well, how do I do that? Pretty easy, I can just take a timestamp before I execute the function and then after I execute the function and just subtract them. Now that works perfectly fine, but what if I had a bunch of other functions that I wanted to measure the duration in the same way? Well, a simple way I could do it is I could just duplicate the logic and it would work, but it wouldn't look very nice. Can we make it cleaner if we turn this timer into a function? For example, let's call it timed. And the argument is gonna be the original function, which I'm gonna name the argument inner function. And I can just pass this in as an object. If I don't call the curly braces when I pass this in, the function is referred to as an object. And now this works in Python and actually most major programming languages because all functions are also objects behind the scene. And you can use any object as arguments to a function. So we can add all of that timer logic around here and in the middle, call the actual function that we want to decorate. So that's where the term decorator comes from. However, if we use this function right away, like this, then it would just execute the timer as soon as we called it. Not to mention, we don't have a way to pass in the arguments to the inner function anymore. And if we tried to call the function with the arguments, like this, then those functions actually get evaluated first before we even enter the scope of the timed function. What we really want is for the timed function to actually extend these inner functions with the duration timer and give us a new modified function that we can use in its place. So going back to our decorator function, we actually have to make it return another function. That's right, it's pretty much functions all the way down. So I'm gonna create a new function and I'm gonna call it wrapped function inside this decorator. I'm gonna make it pass through every argument it receives to the inner function. Now, if the star args and double star keyword args notation looks strange to you, then don't worry about it for now. It basically just means that we wanna pass through every argument that we supply to the decorated function directly through to the inner function, whether that's a single number, a list of numbers, strings, or anything at all. And finally, we will return a copy of that wrapped function. So now the transformation is complete and I can use it to create a decorated or a modified function that I can use in place of my original function. Let's take a look at an example like this. And that's pretty much all there is to it. That is how a decorator works. But now in Python, there's actually a syntax shortcut to do all of this as well. So instead of actually wrapping the functions manually like this, you can use the at symbol with the name of your decorator function directly above the functions you want to wrap. That looks much better than what we had before. Now we can just use them directly uh, with the name of the original function and they will have that decorated functionality of the timer every time we use them. Also, here is the code for the three decorators that I used as examples at the start of the video. If you want to take a closer look at them, then you can also find them in the GitHub project link in the video description. Now let's get a bit hands-on and use a Python decorator to solve a famous optimization problem. This is the Fibonacci sequence. 
Mother Nature's Golden Ratio. If you haven't seen it before, then it's a series of numbers where the value is equal to the sum of the previous two values in the sequence. Let's create a function to calculate the Fibonacci value for a given number, n. It's a recursive function that simply returns the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers in that sequence until it's at or near zero. So when I run it for the input 10, the answer is 55. So far, so good. Now, what if I wanted to measure how long it takes? Let's take our timer function that we created from the uh, previous section and add it to this method. Well, it works, but because the function is recursive, it ran the timer for each execution of the function separately. Uh, so to work around that, I can wrap this entire print statement into a function and then add the timer to that. And that works fine. At n equals 10, the function is done almost instantly. But as I increase the input up to 40, well, at 40, the answer took 30 seconds to complete. That's insane. That's because the runtime of the Fibonacci algorithm is exponential, big O2 to the power of n. If you're unfamiliar with runtime complexity analysis, all it means is that it's far too slow to do anything useful. Now, the silver lining to this function is that for any given input n, the answer is always going to be the same universally and forever. So if we write a decorator to remember what the answer is for any given input uh, to this function, we can use it to store the answer for each input in the dictionary, and we'll never have to calculate the answer twice for the same input. And the implementation of this function is really simple. I'm gonna call it cache result, and it's gonna take the inner function as usual. I'm gonna have a results dictionary, uh, which I'm gonna use to store the key, which is the input of the function. It's gonna be a number, and then that'll map to the Fibonacci value that I want to remember. And here in my wrapped function, I'm going to check whether the key is already in results or not. If it's not, then I'm going to calculate it and then put it into the results. Otherwise, I'm just going to return the value at that index. Finally, I'll return the wrapped function, and that is my decorator. So now I can decorate my print Fibonacci function uh, with this cache results decorator, and uh, I can run this print Fibonacci twice with the same input just to see if it works. And as expected, you can see that it's working because the first invocation took 30 seconds, but the second time I called it, because it already remembers the value, it went straight down to zero because all it had to do was just fetch the value in the dictionary and it didn't have to go through all that complex recursion again just to get the answer. But the first invocation of that function is still slow and I promise you that I would optimize it, not just for the second or the subsequent invocations, but for all of them. Well, the secret to optimizing recursive functions is that as the recursion happens, the inner function, the recursive function, in this case Fibonacci, is actually called many times with the exact same input values. For example, when we call fib5, we actually end up calling fib3 and fib4. But when we call fib4, we need to call fib3 again, and fib2, and so on. So there's actually a lot of repetitions. In fact, if you draw out all the calls as a diagram, then most of the calls in that diagram will be repeated calls. Once we know the answer to fib3 though, the answer is never gonna change. So the trick here is to store the result and never call the function again with that same input twice. So let's move over that cache result decorator to the actual Fibonacci function instead and see what happens. And when we run it again, we can see that the function now pretty much executes instantly, going from 30 seconds to almost zero. Before we wrap up, I also want to quickly run through where else you might be able to find decorators in Python. Web frameworks like Flask and FastAPI make extensive use of decorators for defining the API routes. Python itself also has a couple of built-in decorators, uh, especially for class methods. The common ones I use are property and static method decorator. The property decorator lets you reference functions on your class as if they were a property, so without any brackets, and you can even do calculations or conversions in them. That's pretty useful. The static method decorator turns an instance method into a static class method that you can call via the class itself, and then you don't need to pass in the self argument. Again, pretty useful if you want to, a way to organize your functions and classes a little bit better. I also like the data class decorator. Again, very powerful stuff. It lets me create a class that pretty much acts like a struct in Python. So instead of having to write a class for a vector object like this, I can instead write this. And I can even add arguments to do special things to it, like make it immutable. So none of the values or attributes can change after I create it. By the way, if you want to reduce your debugging time by 28%, 
don't fact check me, make your objects immutable. If you enjoyed this video and want to know when I post more content like this, then please subscribe to my channel. Or you can check out some of my other videos here. Otherwise, I hope you found this useful and thank you for watching.